Um, so my name is Wen Jin and I was born in England and live in London. And this is my print studio, East London Printmakers in the heart of East London, to which you're all very welcome. If you come to London, please let me know. So some of you might know, I don't know how many do, but I trained as a vet um, 20 something years ago. And I actually finished the qualification and I have worked in various places. Um, exotic animals are not my strong point, but this was my first time with a chameleon and she couldn't pass her eggs. So I remember the, the thrill of holding on to this beautiful creature. Um, now, the reason why I trained to be a vet was because I grew up in a family business, a veterinary practice. This is my dad's sign outside the front door. And he had a dream that he would have Homer soon, veterinary surgeon and daughter. He really wanted to make the family business a little bit bigger and continue the tradition. And throughout all of my childhood, I was crazy about art. I really wanted to be an artist. I drew the cats, I drew my sisters, and I went to art school and I thought, this is not what I wanna do. How can I make, make, sorry, veterinary school? How can I make veterinary school into my creative foundation course? So if you look at this very beautiful slide of bacteria, you can imagine this is quite good training for learning how to draw um, abstract objects. And there is quite a lot of humor in the veterinary world. Um, like this slide just kills me laughing, the before and after weight loss picture of the dog with the grid behind it. So it's kind of like postmodern ironic art statement. And it's a job that requires quite a lot of creativity. So I found myself improvising things or using knowledge that I had from one field and applying it to another field. So it wasn't such a bad foundation course after all. Nevertheless, I absolutely hated my final year. It was very practical. We had to change rotation every two, two weeks. And I started to make this diary about all the things I really hated about vet school. It says, don't become a vet unless you love and then every scene is something that really irritated me or upset me at the time, like vomiting bulldogs, uh, tall cows, which um, if you have long hair, the poo gets in your ear. So it's really terrible. You find it days later. Um, live pigs. I was so grumpy because I hated the sound of them screaming. Um, the fact that you had to wear really practical outfits and that there was always a risk of being bitten or blood falling on your shoes. And, um, you know, the practicalities of having um, having hospital, they made the students run the hospital. So we basically slept there at night in turns of the dogs out. So this is the dog walking by moonlight, which, as you know, is very hazardous because you don't know what you might be walking on. And the kind of humor, the terrible humor of um, watching the fertility program. This was actually quite a disaster. We had this young bull and none of the cows were getting pregnant <laughs> and they made us um, check him out. And we came to the conclusion he was gay because he just wasn't really very interested in, in the girls. And when he came into the hospital, he made best friends with the bull next doors. So I think there is gayness in the um, animal world as well. So it's a gay bull. Uh, but there we were waiting for him to do something so we could get a sample of sperm. <laughs> and I wasn't the worst at, the, um, at my studies, even though I wasn't very motivated. So it turned out I was quite good at expressing bladders. The Great Dane with a, a back problem. And I really enjoyed surgery, which ties into making things. So um, my cult castrate was me smiling away as the first picture of me actually looking happy. So I mentioned my father. This is my dad. He was a very, very keen bodybuilder. And this is him at the age of 75, working out in the kitchen. And some people might have seen the film. I made a short film, but this is the clip of him in the garden, um, showing off his muscles and um, quite um, 
proud of his physique and really enjoying being out in nature. His favorite things to do would be to run and to cycle and to swim. And um, if you've watched my film, you'll also know that um, when he was running out one morning, he tripped and fell badly against a tree and he ended up breaking his neck and he spent the rest of his life in a care home in um, you know permanently being looked after not living independently again so this happened in 2014 and it was an absolute tragedy for the whole family um, we were all in shock this very physical person who was the joker of the family had suddenly lost his ability to move and that was his expression with the world so I used to go and draw him hang out listen to his stories and try and get him to think about the moment and take him away from his situation and after a while I thought well it's a little bit um, too temporary to have these short visits that only last a few hours every week um, it wouldn't it be nice to leave a picture behind. So coincidentally, I got this fellowship award at the Royal Academy Schools in London from 2016 to 2018. And this is the beautiful press. You shouldn't really use it like a table, but I'm using it like a table. Um, it's a cast iron press and it's very good for relief printing. And the deal was that you would go in once a week for 60 weeks and look after the studio and if anyone came in, you'd help them print. And if they didn't come in, you could make a print of your own. So I thought, well, I'm going to make a short project. I thought it was short at the time, 2016. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'm going to make small prints that are all going to be the same size. And they're all going to be made on lino, uh, Japanese vinyl, which is green. And they're all going to be maximum two colors. I'm going to make them quickly and see where I end up. And it's going to be like a diary situation. So this is a picture of me going to draw him and how he was dreaming of walking and swimming and running and everything. So the kind of yearning was very much at the back of my mind. It was the basis of this series. The first print I made, I was just so sad. I just thought I'm going to cry my eyes out like this person who I really admire, respect and love is unable to do what he loves doing. And this is like trapped in a world that's absolutely no fun at all and has no dignity. So it's uh, me crying my eyes out. But the um, life school is actually kind of amazing. It has this big collection of old busts and even the cast sculpture of a horse that belonged to George Stubbs from the 18th century and this gorgeous skeleton. So my first pictures were just observational. I just made this kind of, okay, I'm gonna make a picture of the horse. I'm gonna make a picture of the skeleton. I'm gonna make a picture of the busts. And then I thought, you know what? If I'm going to make them relevant to who I am and what I'm doing at this moment in time, I think I need to put myself in, this, in the view, in the screen as well. So there's, um, this, is, this is the way up that the print is normally seen but um, I've just turned it upside down on the right hand side so you can see that I've inserted myself at one of the holes and I've put my hand and my pen into the corner of the uh, image as well. Now the Royal Academy schools, oldest school in the UK, I think it's over 250 years old. And they have this beautiful corridor called the cast corridor. And then every day at one o'clock, they have a chef who makes lunch for the whole school. So everybody would go sit down, you sit next to anybody at all. So students and staff and technicians all mingling together and chat and relax. And having eaten together, we were just so happy and so contented and so full that we had um, this very open and, and joyous um, creativity process enabled because we weren't hungry and I started the fellowship when I had no work and I was really hungry so this is a, a, a an image from the first meal that I had there that was like um, 
a kind of celebration and a little bit of guilt at the quantity of food. It was like Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year rolled into one. So like a mountain of, um, of nutrition and celebration, more meat than I can eat. So these are the little blocks. They're small and green. I don't know if you've seen them, but they come from Japan. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to start to see if I can engage my dad in imagery that will make him laugh. So the first theme, I've just selected several themes from the work that I've made and put them together. The first theme is swimming pools. I love swimming and I love swimming too. And, um, but you know, we're in London, so we have this beautiful outdoor pool, but indoor changing room. And I wanted to show him what it's like to be dripping wet and completely addicted to the cell phone screen to see what, you know, what's happened in that 20 minutes that I spent away from it. So kind of poking fun at that environment. And also I swam in this tiny pool in East London, which had, uh, it was a community pool and it didn't have a mirror. It just had a piece of beaten metal. So when you walk past this kind of fake mirror, you would look really distorted and it would make you jump in shock. So I wanted to do a picture about this kind of like being in this female space, but then evaluating what is truth and what is lies and also being surrounded by people who are completely focused in their own world. Um, in East London, there's a very big Bangladeshi Muslim community. So there are people who swim with a headscarf on and they're quite happy to hang out with the people who take all their clothes off when they're changing. So I kind <laughs> of like that um, humor, or that tension. Now, this is the same pool. They got a grant and they bought a mirror and this uh, lady oh, really just, just so amazed by the mirror she would hang out in front of it with no clothes on <laughs> and uh, we would just um, I remember being kind of shocked and kind of envious like why am I why am I um, surprised that somebody admiring the um, completely perfectly able body um, in a mirror, like, why am I um, finding this such a, a transgression? Um, so anyway, this print is called She Doesn't Care If We Stare. And it's my mom's favorite print. because She says, isn't that woman so beautiful? But I really like that. There are not very many depictions of women in um, contemporary culture that are not hypersexualized or, um, you know, power, power dynamics. <laughs> I just uh, telling you about a few more pools in London in case you ever come, but this is the Olympic oh. pool. In so East I London. Have you ever been? Um, there's this That's beautiful so sign up that says, this hairdryer is solely to dry your hair. Please do not use to dry your body or any other items in capitals. <laughs> oh, <my>. and, <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I was wondering, what the big deal was when I realized they really had, <laughs> you know, they had I a point. This. Um, yeah, it did it, make me laugh quite a lot. Um, yes. And then the politics of the pool, this is pre COVID, but you know how when you have a multiple, to what? multiple uh, pools and uh, showers, and um, when people choose to have a shower right next to you, even though there's plenty of other showers nearby. So the politics of being crowded and having somebody display their armpits to you <laughs> just when you're trying to mind your own business. So these are all prints that I hoped would make him laugh. And I haven't said, but a lot of them have tiny details in the corner. So you can maybe spend a lot of time looking at it. You'll see something immediately. And then maybe if you spend a bit more time, you might see something secret in the edges of this frame. Now, I don't know if this one, but you can count all these strange bodies that are on the side in the little outdoor shower. And this is my pool. It's, it's called uh, London Fields Lido. And the joy of this pool is that it's heated, but it's outdoors. So in the winter, when it's really cold, you walk 
through the cold air and get into this warm thing which has a steam rising and it's all very beautiful and atmospheric. Hawaii is much nicer though, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> Not a patch on Hawaii, but never mind. <laughs> so the second thing that we really connect with is uh, veterinary, um, our veterinary profession. So, and I think anyone who's ever had a pet knows how um, loyal and, and fantastic that bond can be. And so I wanted to kind of remind him of the careful and um, tender friendship that we have with our animal companions. And also the absurdity of working. So um, yeah, things like this, this print is called This Happens. And, um, you know, cats will get onto their owner's head and then the owner will turn and say, can you check him from here? And you'll be like, well, let me see. So this kind of absurdity is very sweet. Um, situations and this is one of my favorite prints and it's called hamster love and it's a true story about um time i worked in a charity called the people's dispensary for sick animals which has a remit to treat anybody who wants treatment for their pets with no charge at all i mean they can give a a minimum of a, like a seven dollar donation and that's the minimum recommended amount. And some people give like $10 and that's it. And they have everything. So in a way, um, it allows you to do whatever you want without worrying about money. And they taught us all how to do ultrasound scans. So this is an ultrasound on this tiny little hamster with a lump in its belly that I knew well, it didn't feel right. And it wasn't supposed to be there and the little hamster wasn't eating properly, not moving around properly. But I wanted to also do this image of the kind of tenderness and um, adoration that we have for our pets, and also the kind of sensation of how we read visual imagery that can be completely meaningless to anyone else. Like it's kind of iconography. The screen is like this abstract pulsing, um, you know, set of pixels, and we have to um, pronounce the future from reading this kind of very abstract form. So it's a little bit about that too. And this is also another print from that same place. It's a guinea pig with bladder stones, which you might be able to see on the um, on the operating table. But um, when I make imagery, I normally uh, remember how it feels to be in that place. And so I draw from a kind of fisheye haptic memory of space. So often I'll draw the, like, for example, you can see the gloves look too big on my hands because they, I remember them being a little bit long for my fingers. So they're a little bit puffy at the fingertips. So I remember that. I remember how um, the nurse had her hand underneath the drape to make sure that little heart was still beating okay. Yeah. But I don't remember the feet. I don't remember where my legs were. I don't remember whether I was standing or sitting. So the feet are missing in this picture. So it's a kind of um, sort of subjective memory that's very inaccurate and very unphotographic, but tells a story nonetheless. This is about uh, caesareans. Um, I don't know if you know French bulldogs, they can't give birth on their own. Wash in a basket, remember, decorated for Halloween. I love that And then I have a statue of Sacagawea, and I apologize. Hello. Sorry about that. Yeah, I got to take care of. OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, this is a picture of a double cesarean, which happened one Sunday, and um, the, the babies have to be um, rubbed awake um, to make sure that they're fine and they're breathing okay. So there's this, also this kind of sense of reverence in the same way as you would for maybe human birth, but at the same time, there's an absurdity because it's um, little, little dogs and little puppies. But every now and then, you know that um, 
disaster strikes and um, no matter how hard you try, there'll be a very angry and aggressive individual that isn't very keen to be in the clinic. So this picture made my dad laugh quite a bit. Um, and the lady was actually speaking Italian, so it was even funnier in reality. I'm stuck. Oops. And this print really did make him laugh, and it was true. Um, I finally got bitten after all these years quite badly by a poodle um, because um the owner was so sad he was just sobbing into the poodle's fur and i got completely sidetracked by the uh, story and this poodle waited and waited and waited while we talked and talked and he got really fed up and decided to bite me and my finger does bend but for a really long time i thought it wouldn't come back to life so and i guess this is also a, a print that suddenly steps outside of the boundaries of veterinary um, medicine and into the conversation about the war in Ukraine. I actually made this print in February this year, and um, I call it the dogs of war uh, because I feel like there's this kind of unleashed aggressive energy that is um, very hard to counteract, very um, terrifying. So even though they're supposed to be funny, some of these are not very funny at all. Food. Well, everybody loves food. Um, this is my cousin in Malaysia eating noodles. And it, the, the cafe is called the Hungry Cat Cafe. So you can see the hungry cat, but there are also these cat soy sauce bottles. And is one of these also one of those images where you can look in the corners and see clues like see the mother with her child and and see the um you know maybe father and daughter and and see what's going on imagine other narratives in the scene and this is my brother and his wife uh in a very fancy cafe called Meloa coffee house and the gimmick of this coffee house is that you have a cup of coffee and a bowl of candy floss on top and as the steam rises the candy floss melts and you end up with this cloud uh, that looks really very pretty on the photos and it tastes awful but it's really nice to look at and so um, we were there just hanging out the cake looked nice and tasted terrible so I was drawing instead of eating the cake and drinking the coffee but um, you know the kind of idea of being somewhere and hanging out in companionable silence He's actually crazy about his teddy bears and he's crazy about going out to eat. So there they are with their huggy bear um, at a high tea in a beautiful Singaporean hotel. I think we're eating dim sum here. And this is kind of frenzy, you know, that when you eat something very delicious, it's a very celebratory moment in time. I actually made this print in the middle of lockdown when I was very sad and I was thinking about all the things that I adore and the things that make me happy. So um, you can spend time and look at everything. There's quite a lot of sensible food. There's a fish and watermelon and cabbage and then Kong, the little lotus things and um, noodles and chips and soya milk. And then there's all the luxuries like cake and wine and several bottles of whiskey, some eggs, and chocolate. So I was kind of talking about in a slightly sad way about how food makes me happy. And, um, um, you know, that's what we're made of. We're made of this, you know, nutrients. We put it in and we come out, it grows an extra hair on your head or something. So um, there's something really amazing about it. And then I think it's become into a very joyful picture rather than a sad one. But it was, you know, I was cooking for, I was cooking for no company. So I would sit alone in my in kitchen, cook a big tray of chicken and then have nobody to share it with. So this is a little bit of a lamentation about the, um, the pandemic making us eat alone. And here I am again, eating with the companionship of my orchid um, trifle. I'm eating trifle. Technology. 
Um, I mean, it strikes me that there aren't very many prints, or maybe there are now, but there weren't very many prints that talk about technology in terms of the ubiquity of mobile phones and uh, laptops and um, how it's all encompassing. It feels like another limb. You know, there's a very um, strange sensation that it's part of your body and that without this device, you feel a little bit lost and very disconnected from the world. And this is when I did a, a whole conference in Sweden and um, I had to do it from my bedroom. And I was really heartbroken because I was looking forward to eating Swedish cakes. And here I am, like falling asleep with my cell phone next to me and working the kind of portability of it. You know, all you need is a laptop. You can work in the jungle if you want, as long as you have internet. You can multitask. Nobody's seeing what I'm doing outside of this frame of the screen. And there's a dark side to it. So um, my workplace gave me an iPad to use because I wanted to record the gestures and touch. I wanted to see, um, deconstruct how I draw. And when it arrived in the post, it said that it was remotely monitored by work. And um, I was a little bit uh, anxious about it. And I said, well, I'm trying to form a relationship with the drawing device. And that if I feel that you can monitor my drawing, I'm not going to use it. So we had this standoff where they said it's for security and privacy reasons. And I said, yeah, but I want to be honest with my technology and I don't want to be tracked at every stage. And finally, I told them the story of the Hans Christian Andersen story about the girl with the red shoes. I said, do you remember that story about the girl who was very vain and she got some beautiful red shoes and she took them to church and um, she was cursed. Um, can't remember who, by an old lady who made her dance and she couldn't stop dancing. She was attached to the shoes and she's exhausted, but her feet keep going without her being able to stop. And I imagine that with this remote monitored device that I would be exhausted, but I wouldn't be able to stop drawing. And at the end of the, of the um, fairy tale, she begs somebody to chop her feet off and they're chopped off and they keep dancing without her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I told this guy in the university, you know, I, I feel like even if I chopped my hands off, they would keep drawing without me. And that's when he agreed to remove, remove the remote monitoring and allow me to use the uh, device on, without any kind of um, surveillance. Oh <laughs> um, yes, yeah, sorry, these anecdotes are a little bit long. Um, anyway, this is the effect of COVID and the uh, um, hiding inside an Amazon delivery box, crying with my shoes on the outside because I'm still very uh, neat about my inside space. This takes me on to COVID. Now, I don't know how many of you might have seen my film, but I thought if we have some time, I would love to show you the, um, the short film. It's about six minutes long. So I was... I, I, as I told you, I started this series of prints in 2016, and by 2018, I'd made about 70 of them. And I thought, well, maybe I'll make a couple more and then I'll stop, maybe around 100. So it got to um, 100th print, which was the teddy bear print. And then COVID struck, and I found myself with this incredible excess of time and I wasn't allowed to go and see my father because he his care home locked down and I had these you know romantic um, despair that I would forever sleep alone and this print is called holding air you know and so I decided to make this film called COVID tales I don't know if you've seen it John shall I do you mind if I show it please do okay and it's six minutes. Hi, I'm Wen Jin. I'm going to talk about COVID Tales, a new series of lino cuts which I have made over the past few months in lockdown. I am an artist that trained as a vet 20 years ago. Veterinary medicine is a practical job. It's full of comical moments, surprising challenges, and interesting clients. After being bitten one time too many, 
I decided enough was enough. So in November 2019, I made the jump to a desk job at the Centre for Fine Print Research, University of the West of England, as a researcher. Now, I had to deal with office life and a whole set of new acronyms. I found myself spending lots of time travelling between London and Bristol, catching up on reading and writing. Then, as you all know, the pandemic struck. Suddenly, I felt myself wearing a cloak of potential poison. My breath was a weapon. I had been visiting my father weekly, but now these visits were cancelled and touch was forbidden. I felt very lucky to be living alone just as lockdown happened. I could still drink tea in my kitchen, pondering the world and feel safe in my space. But every evening, scrolling through the headlines, increasingly fearful of what they would bring, I'd stay awake and worry. My studio in East London shut, so I repurposed the corner of the living room as a makeshift printing area. At first, it was really fun. I could work in the bathroom on the floor, if I wanted to, and not wear trousers, and enjoy being at home all day. I could garden at lunchtime, I could cut the lawn with scissors and plant potatoes, and, during spring, I took two weeks to enjoy the blossom. It was a paradise, a leafy haven, but somehow out of step with the feeling of dread that people I loved might get ill. Slowly, the lack of human contact made me feel one-dimensional. It was all too easy to turn off the video and sound during work meetings and sob without anyone noticing a thing. I made this print when I was missing my family the most. It says, Oh, I wish I could hug you again. I dreamed of a perfect meal that I'd like to share with my dad. It says, If you were here, I'd invite you for lunch. We would have mackerel, grilled quickly, with crushed up cardamom and peppercorns and onions and steamed rice. And for afters, there would be a big bowl of frozen raspberries and ice cream, and we would sit in the sun on the balcony, and a million seconds would pass in a flash. Sometimes, I didn't speak for days. Sometimes I'd call a friend on video chat and lie to them and say I felt absolutely fine. Sometimes I'd get drunk really quite early in the afternoon. Living alone at first felt like a gift. I was so fortunate. I had a job, a place of my own, enough money and plenty of food. I'd bake a whole tray of chicken in the oven, then sit alone, eating as much as I liked. Truly, I lived in a gilded cage, surrounded by all of my favourite things, safe from the outside world. But after a while, I began to feel like I was trapped inside a bulging and broken bin bag. With no one phoning me from work, I wondered whether emails would finally kill me. I pictured my melted body slumped at a collapsing desk and questioned if I'd ever been a valued member of the team. Gradually, my tolerance for the screen increased. The lurching perspectives and detail and magnification were now a bonus. I could zoom around and touch another world. I started to take part in online exercise classes with my phone. Here I am trying to do wide arm push-ups, cardio, leg exercises, and a range of moves never attempted before. Like many others, my hair continued to grow, so I got the scissors out, thinking that it would eventually grow back anyway. My lockdown chop is the shortest it's been in 20 years. The multiple reflections in the mirrors gave me an illusion that I was in company. And nature was a counterbalance to COVID fears. I started to go running in the area, next to magnificent cherry trees, though I was alarmed when I managed to scare another lady on the street. The tree outside my bathroom window burst into flower too. I used to sit there, drinking tea, 
hoping that everyone I knew would remain healthy. Finally, the companionship of my orchids and flowers have sustained me through this time. I would put the orchid blossoms close to my cheeks to feel their energy, to feel watched by another living being. When being in solitude all got too much, I went back to the local clinic to help out on Saturday shifts and to remind myself of what it is like to live in a dangerous, unpredictable, comical and rewarding world. So, thank you for listening to this talk. I wish you all remain healthy and that we will meet soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So I just have a couple of more slides just to show you at the end. Um, of course, um, maybe some of you know, but my dad got very sick in uh, last year. He actually got sick before COVID started and he got double pneumonia. And I wonder if this is exactly a precursor of COVID. Um, but my mom and I went to see him in the hospital and I, I made this print called, this is the size of his spirit. Is he just shrunken before our eyes? Anyhow, uh, he passed away in June last year. And it's been a very hard time because I've lost my um, humorous, my wonderful father, but I've lost his, um, his outlook on life. And he was my main audience member. And I've made a lot of prints since he passed away, but I haven't really finished any of them. Um, this is the only one that I've finished, which maybe you might have seen on my Instagram, but I've just recreated it. It's, um, I recreated it in Utah and we made it as a woodcut and on very thin paper. And I wanted the colors to glow. And it's a print about kind of maybe that if I close my eyes, um, he'll touch, he'll touch the, the walls, he'll come close. So, um, yeah, it's been a very, difficult time. And um, I've been thinking a little bit about the prints that I've made in the past. And um, perhaps this is my only conclusion that we need to look outside of ourselves, um, not inside, but out to the natural world and remind ourselves that we're in a much bigger universe. Um, it's been really amazing coming here because I think it's given me the chance to uh, look at things afresh from afar and to experiment and play again, which was the impetus behind all of this work. It was very playful. There, here are some of the prints. <laughs> I haven't seen them all at once, but here they are. Thank you so much. And thank you, Wanjin. Wow, can you guys give it a love for Wanjin? <laughs> <laughs>